Now tonight, um, I mean, before I, I, I ask uh, Robert Howard to introduce our guest, a very topical and interesting subject, the politics of the Olympics, I'm just going to show you a 90 second clip, which really says it all, because um, this happened at the weekend, uh, just as uh, we were thinking about the Olympics, and shows how politics uh, can enter it in a humorous um, way, in a way which is full of hubris, uh, in a way which is actually very curious. And then what happened here, and we're not going to show the whole video because um, it would take too long, but um, obviously at the London Games, near the opening, first of all, Michelle Obama decided to stage uh, a, a nice um, sort of photo opportunity or two. So she um, got into her running shoes. Uh, it's true that she does jog quite a lot. And she ran into um, an arena full of American athletes and greeted them all and wished them well. And then she went off to the American embassy where for some reason they've got um, half a football pitch set up and she um, played football and inevitably scored a winning goal. <laughs> so, 1-0, one 1-0 nil, one nil to the Obamas. Then Mitt Romney was also in London, but Mitt Romney, I think, was very badly advised because one of the golden rules of the diplomacy is that when you're in another country, you don't actually attack that country unless um, there's some good reason for doing so. And he cast aspersions on the British ability to run an event, which given the uh, event that they did run, and many of you would have seen it on Saturday night, the actual um, opening ceremony, which was a massive pageant and quite well done, um, and has been the sub subject of um, many plaudits. It looked, it looked rather mean and sniffy. But um, the Mayor of London, who is a po conservative politician from the same side of politics, centre-right, as Mitt Romney, um, was infuriated by this because he basically is uh, the maestro of games. It's in London, after all, he's the mayor. So he, um, he leapt forth at um, Romney uh, and he chose to do it in a big audience and uh, Really, well, this is real rabble rising, rousing, what you're going to see. So I thought we'd just kick off this evening before uh, Robert introduced our guest speaker by just looking at this brief soundbite of Boris Johnson, who many people are now saying will be the next Conservative Prime Minister of Britain. is deeply unpopular. So just take a look. There you go. So who, who says there's politics in, in the Olympic Games? Well, we don't need reminding that there is something going on in London called the Olympics. Uh, but is it just a sporting event or is there something more to it? It's often said that sport and politics don't mix, but all the evidence suggests uh, otherwise. Um, and this applies especially to the Olympics. Uh, we look what's happened over the years, this is self-evidently case that the Olympics has often been used as a platform for promoting some poli domestic political issue, uh, but it's more obviously been used as a cause, uh, as a way of promoting nationalist fervour. Um, but this relationship between sport or the Olympics and politics is often very ill-defined. Um, it's almost impressionistic. People suspect there's something there, but they can't quite put their finger on it. And this is what we're going to look at tonight. And we're very privileged, I think, to have Dr. Fiona Gill from uh, the Department of Sociology and Social Policy at the University of Sydney. Uh, Dr. Gill researches in the area of the, the sociology uh, of sport, focuses on issues of the relationship between national gender and sexual identity and sport. And I understand she's actually now carrying out research into national identity and national service in Australia. So I think uh, Dr. Gill is eminently qualified to discuss this topic with us. 
and uh, we're lucky to have her here. First of all, thank you very much, uh, Colin, and Roger, for the invitation to come and talk. Um, thank you to, for coming out on what has been a fairly miserable and cold day. Um, I feel quite bad. I've got to go after Boris, and I'm not sure that I'm going to be quite as exciting <laughs> as he is. Um, but I'm really pleased to have a chance to have a talk about the politics of the Olympics and the politics of sport because I think it's it being an Australian and growing up in Australia um, and growing up uh, particularly in a, in a, a, a not a sport obsessed household but certainly an AFL obsessed household, um, sport has, has really been very much a backdrop to my life. Um, it's been something, sorry, is that better? I'll talk into the microphone. Yep. Um, sport has been very much a backdrop to my life. It's been something I've been involved with all my life, and I'm now able to to combine that with, with an academic interest in sport. So it's wonderful to come out and actually be able to talk talk about it as well. Um, but I also find talking about sport and politics troubling. I um, mean, I find talking about sport and national identity troubling because I think that very often when we talk about sport and national identity in Australia and, and across the world, it tends to be a very, very re simple um, translation that we, we talk about sporting success as being a measure of our value as a nation. Um, if you think about, and we're not alone in this, but if you think about um, Australian history, um, the first time that we sent an Australian cricket team or Australian rugby union team to Britain and we beat them was considered to be really one of those defining moments of up there with, with Gallipoli. We sent soldiers and they did well. We sent sportsmen and we beat the Poms. And that's really been one of the, the enduring kind of discourses, the enduring narratives that we tell about ourselves as a nation, that, that, that we, we are good at sport. This is one of the things we're known for. Um, and I think that this is, this is problematic for a couple of reasons. I think that it's problematic because the sports that we tend to valorise tend to be quite exclusionary. Um, that is, at least 50% of the population tends to be excluded because um, they're women. Um, so the fact that we have world champion netballers, hockey players, uh, world champion and Olympic gold medal swimmer, swimmers, you know, the four by 100 metres that we won, um, is the women's team and yet they got sort of emphasis on page six in an extremely little photo. Uh, the losing men's team got front page coverage and sort of a mass um, beating of chests and gnashing of teeth. What have we done wrong? Um, so the sports that we tend to valorise tend to exclude me, because I am a woman. But they also tend to exclude um, a large portion of the rest of the population simply because, you know, they're a multicultural nation. And yet if you look at the picture of our Australian national team. Um, it's a pretty um, pale and not very colourful picture. Um, we have, I think, two or three Indigenous sports people. They don't have the same profile as Cathy Freeman. Cathy was a fantastic ambassador, um, but she was successful. She did well. Um, the most we've heard about Indigenous sports people so far is the Indigenous boxer who wore a T-shirt with the Aboriginal flag into the ring, and he's been chastised quite severely for doing so. Um, we don't have um, a sports team which represents the diversity of Australian society today. I, I, so I find it very, very problematic. We put a lot of money, a lot of energy into defining what it means to be Australian through sport. And we're not alone in this. The rest of the world does a very similar thing. And yet it doesn't tend to reflect who we are as a nation. So I'm really interested in this for, for, for a multitude of reasons. So this is what I'm, I'm going to be talking about. But what I want to, want to talk about today really is to suggest that, that Sport and international relations, politics of sport, in terms of this, operates really on two, two levels. Um, the first is the role of sport as a mechanism for a certain national or state identity within the international arena. That is, uh, I suppose it's, you know, the ping pong diplomacy, um, sport as, sport as diplomacy. It's an easy way that we can interact with the rest of the world. Um, and the various sort of machinations, uh, machinations around that. And then the responses of us, the citizens, to this. Because I think that, that this is the thing that we forget when we talk about sport as national identity. Um, we talk about elite sport, which doesn't really represent, you know, those of us who are weekend warriors who are enthusiastic, but whose enthusiasm really exceeds our ability. Um, I'm counting myself definitely among that group, and I'm hoping there are a few more of you who kind of recognise that description. Um, 
And really, well, what do we think about people using what we enjoy on Saturday afternoons? Um, you know, when we see our children doing it, when we remember doing it ourselves, when we watch it on television. How do we really respond to the way the state uses sport in this way? Does this relate to how we feel about ourselves? So it's going to be sort of a double way of thing going on. Um, I'm going to focus a little bit on the Olympics because obviously it's the big thing going on right now. Um, but I think that the Olympics is really an exemplar, which is one of the biggest examples in the world. It happens every four years, it pulls people from all over the world. Um, it's one of the only sporting contests which is truly international as opposed to, for example, the Baseball World Cup, um, which is, I think, America and Japan, I believe, joins in now, so that's two countries. Um, uh, the Rugby Union or Rugby League World Cup, which currently encompasses four countries. Um, it's, it's one of the only sporting contests we have representatives from all over the world. It's a genuinely international event. Um, but I think that, that it, what, what I say about the Olympics really does re, uh, resound with other sports as well. Sports operate the same way, um, but the Olympics is, is what we're going to be talking about. So, the first thing then is, well, how do states use sport? Now, I think it would be naive if I was to suggest that sport wasn't political. I know that the Olympics was originally set up as a non-political, all whole hands and single by our kind of event. Um, it was meant to be developed in, in a spirit of friendship. The modern Olympics was really very much about developing a fellowship of men um, and a brotherhood between nations. Um, and so people were going to come together and link arms across national borders, um, compete fairly in the spirit of good sportsmanship, swap t-shirts and, and go home. Um, and I, I think that that's a lovely ideal. And I think that to a certain extent, particularly at local level sports, this still tends to be the case. That, that if you think about you know, your local, you know, sons and daughters playing you know, the local a soccer or netball or hockey or whatever, there is still that sort of sense of, of community and, and fair play, particularly at the very, very young levels, um, where you have the movable scrum moving across the field and all the parents kind of clap for everyone. Um, there's still that sort of sense of camaraderie, and at certainly lower levels of sport, that's still the case. But I would suggest that that's no longer the case. Um, and I think things did actually change, particularly in the sort of 20th century, basically. Um, I would suggest, however, that although it is used extensively in international politics, and it's an important tool in international politics, it is not as simple as saying that sport is the equivalent to war, nor would I suggest that sport is simply um, or holding hands. I think that the, the, the use of sport is something which is quite subtle um, and it changes according to what position a state or nation has in the international order and what's going on at home. So I think that international sport plays both to the external audience for the state, that is it is a way of talking to other nations, but critically it's also a way of talking to its own citizens. So it works both inwards and outwards. So, Sport then is used by nations at events such as the Olympics, which is a really good international stage, um, for two reasons. First of all, it's used as a means of boosting national state prestige. So, um, obviously, um, Berlin Olympics 1936 is the best known example. I think I've just lost the argument if we invoke Goldman's law. But nonetheless, you know, the Nazi Olympics is one of the prime ways of examples where you actually saw sport being explicitly used as a means of saying that this particular political program works. It was set up as a means of promoting the sort of the primacy of their um, race, the primacy of the German political system. This is the way it's going to be. This is all great. And actually, it's been used over and over again in the same way. So if you think about um, Things like um, the discourses which occurred around the USA-Iran football match in 1998, which occurred in France 1998, that was uh, put, portrayed in the media as being very much both a clash between the USA and Iran, which wasn't going to happen via conventional warfare, um, but also as, as a kind of a, a clash between two competing political regimes. Again, this happened throughout the Cold War as well. Every time the USA and the Soviet Union met, every time the USA and China met, it was again, it was the same. It was very much about two ways of, of being clashing. And it was assumed that this would be resolved on the sports field. Um, it also, it's best well known also through the GDRs and the Chinese doping scandals which occurred. 
So particularly through the 1950s, the, the German Democratic Republic was uh, so fixated on sport as being a mechanism for promoting the, the um, socialist way of being that doping was simply state instituted. So everyone was doped as a matter of, of um, course. It was an extraordinarily successful um, policy in terms of medals, um, less successful, I would suggest, for the athletes themselves, but, but um, unfortunately I suggest that, that people would argue that these were simply necessary casualties. This is the way politics works sometimes. Um, so success in, um, in international sport is seen to equate to the success of a specific political or national ideology. This works extremely well if you're good at sport. However, staying with Nazi theme, sport is unpredictable. The sport is competitive. So unless you're able to bribe the you know, match officials and the opposing team to you know, play with one leg or run in the wrong direction or not start, um, occasionally things go wrong. Nazi Olympics, obviously. Um, yeah, the wrong person won the race. Um, this was extremely embarrassing. Um, you know, the wrong team wins. There are cases, particularly of the you know, football teams in the Middle East, um, who were pulled off the plane into a prison camp because they had failed to do as well as they should have done. So they were berated by the dictator, and so you had a group of professional footballers all sitting on the ground going, we're all going to die, and really we just want to go back to Europe to our professional careers. Um, the wrong team won in that instance. And so, obviously, international prestige suffered. Um, the other problem, of course, is, is things around hosting events. Hosting something like the Olympics can be a fantastic achievement. I mean, you know, Sydney still rides on the back of Sydney 2000, best Olympics ever. Yeah. Um, this, is, this is really important, but of course things go wrong. Right? So an example of this we can see um, in 1995 in Zimbabwe, who were hosting six All-Africa Games. It was supposed to be a very, very important event for Mugabe. And we're doing a good job here. So they built a brand spanking new stadium, funded by the Chinese, supporting the Marxist regime. Um, unfortunately, uh, the timing of the opening ceremony, which is supposed to be one of the highlights, so everyone was going to come in and see the, the flame lit and athletes marching in the big deal. Um, new stadium, which was ready, but the timing of the opening ceremony changed without notice. All of the, uh, all of the public um, transport, which was needed to transport the spectators to the stadium was diverted in order to transport all the athletes to the stadium to march so that the spectators were unable to get physically to where they needed to be. Uh, the tickets were actually priced too much for most of the people to actually afford so even if they could get to the stadium they were unable to actually afford to get into the stadium. And then um, in, as they, they sort of brought the torch around a largely empty and echoing stadium um, it constantly had to be relit. Um, so Mugabe, who who who's invited large numbers of the international press and large numbers of world leaders there to show his regime, was actually left with egg on his face because the whole thing was a simple disaster. So it became quite clear to canny political leaders that using or relying on sport and sporting success as a means of boosting international prestige was possibly not the most reliable option in terms of using sport politically. That is, if you can rely on people to win the races they should, and you can rely on everything going according to plan, you're, you're fine. But that isn't the way sport operates. Sport is something which is unpredictable. It's one of the reasons we like watching it. So the second way you can actually use sport in terms of international presence is simply by participating. That is, in participating in a, in a sports or an event such as the Olympics, you are actually being acknowledged as being an equal participant in the international community. And this is why sporting boycotts are actually quite important. That is, if you think about the boycotts of the Olympics throughout the 1980s, if you think about the sporting boycott of South Africa, um, these are really powerful and important ways of actually indicating you don't really like what you're doing, so we're not going to leave. It's a bit like sort of, well, it's, it's very ch sort of children in the playground, isn't it? We're not going to let you play with us. Go away. And the great thing about sporting boycotts in terms of membership in the international community is that economically they're not particularly problematic. So in the case of the um, South African sporting boycott, um, Britain actually had a debate as to whether you just go down the sporting route or whether you also economically boycott the, the nation. 
Economically, if you boycott it, it had very detrimental effects on Britain. That is, jobs suffered, um, exports suffered, imports suffered. There were some serious knock-on effects. But if you simply don't play cricket with them, well, you can still play against you know, Australia and Zimbabwe and New Zealand, and, and that's really OK. Um, so participation has become a much more important way of measuring prestige and acceptance in the international community. And so if a sporting nation can be accepted into the Olympics, for example, it means they're kind of accepted as being a part of us, if you like. You're not on the outer anymore, you're part of the grand international community. It's one of the interesting things about this Olympics, actually, is these things around uh, conditions being placed on, um, I think, Saudi Arabia, making sure you had to have women in the team. If you have women in the team, well, you're not coming to the Olympics. Well, they've got women in the team. Of course, one of them can't compete because the International Judo Federation won't let her compete wearing a hijab. Um, they've got um, an equestrian, which isn't really a, a, I mean, it's a sport for the elite, let's face it. It's not really something which the masses in Saudi Arabia necessarily watch. Um, and also a runner. And so they've got these, these sort of three women who are kind of being shoved in um, so that they can, they can come in. But that means they're part of the community. The interesting thing I thought about the whole lead up was whether or not Syria would or would not be allowed to participate. And actually, there was sort of a little tiny bit of debate about whether they should or shouldn't be allowed in. And I think they just end up sneaking in anyway. So, you know, we, we have this sort of understanding of if you are part of the international community, you will be welcome to send a team in. And so emerging states, when they come out, um, when they're actually welcome into the international community, that's when you kind of know. That's where you, know, you get the huge uh, rounds of applause for, for example, the Iraqi team uh, when, they, when they arrived after um, America had sort of been involved the first time. Um, you know, when, when they arrived, there was this, this huge sort of opening of, of sort of, you know, welcome, this sort of sense that you are a new Iraq and therefore you are welcome. Um, and so the athletes were really supported through that. So that's, that's sort of one way in which, which um, states use, use um, sport, which is very much about sort of putting themselves onto the international stage. I am very uneasy, though, about um, you know, the use of sporting events as being a substitute for war. I am aware that certainly battles have broken out over soccer matches. Um, but, you know, I don't think it's, it's, it's really not the same. Most people don't actually understand in that way. If you talk about the Olympics, certainly, you very rarely see nations going to war because they've lost a match. Um, you might see athletes having a go at each other over particular political differences. So the Melbourne Olympics being one example of that occurring. The Hungary um, Soviet team, uh, World Polo team, had the Vestushi in the pool. Um, but, but, you know, overall, um, sport tends to tick on regardless. It's what goes on behind the scenes which really counts. So um, sport is really used very much to present for nations to present themselves. But the other way, though, I would suggest that, that sport is important, is more internal. That is, sport, I believe, is used by nations um, as a way of preparing their citizenry for war. And this is where I have more problems with, with sport. Now, um, now this is based on an understanding that we talk about sport an awful lot. We're all very familiar with the, the language we use to, to, um, to talk about sport. Um, and we're all very familiar with, with what it means to be part of a nation. Even if we don't exclude, like, express it, we're all very much aware of the language which is used around it. So, what is a nation? Let's, let's very briefly go over this. A nation is a community. That is, it is a group of people who understand themselves to be similar in some way. Now, it might be similar according to history, it might be similar according to language, it might be similar according to appearance. Nation is based, nations are based on all of those sorts of things. But, particularly, nations are based on territory. That is, it is almost impossible to find a nation in existence which does not have a relationship to a specific bit of dirt. Australia has a fairly neatly defined, with a few outlying, we have an island. For most of the rest of the world, however, um, nations and territories are quite contested. Now, you think about Israel as one of the, the easiest examples, a territory which is carved out 
a space which is carved out of other nations. And the fact that people are still arguing over well, where is the boundary, who owns this pit, who should have access to this pit, um, is replicated in, in, you know, across Spain, um, in Britain to a certain extent. The um, English Scottish border is where I did my PhD work. And there's still not actual violence going on, although that did happen occasionally. But certainly there was a lot of debate about who belonged where and where the border should be drawn. This is something which people still matter, and the reason is because boundaries are where we define it, where we stop and they start. And it's really important, right, if we want to talk about who belongs and who doesn't, it's important to be able to draw that line. And it really helps if you draw a neat line on a sort of sand, if you like, and say, well, Australia, or we, belong up to this part, and then beyond that is someone else. So territory is critically important. History is critically important. The stories that we tell about ourselves tell us who we are. And in Australia, we have some very, very dominant um, narratives. Um, World War I is critically important in terms of defining who we are in Gallipoli, the 25th of April. Very important. It's one of the things that we get taught as, as Australians, is you know, we started here. Federation doesn't matter so much, but, but the Gallipoli and the Anzac myth is critically important. And if you, you listen to to um, any kind of, sort of particularly populist history, this sort of myth keeps on coming up again and again and again. And of course, when you travel, as an Australian, I travel overseas, I was talking about nationalism <coughs> to, a group, to a group of students, and I sort of mentioned Anzac Day, and everyone sort of went completely silent. And I then had to give them a potted history of what the liquid was, what Anzac Day was, and why it was so important. And of course, I had to explain it was basically a military mistake. Um, but you know, what we make of that mistake is, is the important thing, right? How do we tell the story of it? Do we say, well, we landed the wrong bit because of someone else's mistake? We kind of hung on quite tightly for a while and then we stuck away, which is one way of telling it. Or you tell the story of an its hardship, of sacrifice, of mateship, of death on the beach, as in, you know, climbing up the, under a hail of machine gun fire and, and, and you know, self-sacrifice, and then withdrawing with no casualties, and Simpson and his donkey. These sorts of, these are, these are very powerful emotive stories which we tell ourselves. That's an important part of who we are as Australians. Now, that history and stories like that, so the Bradman, um, Bradman story is really important in the Bodyline, the Bodyline series in the 1930s. Remember that, that great um, mini-series? Um, that had a very big, I mean, I, I remember bits of it still, and it had a very, very big impact on me, um, which was kind of the story of, of um, from nothing to hero to disaster and back to hero and saving the day against the English, which is another massive trope in Australian history and the way we tell ourselves. Um, but again, that's, that's that, that real story about, about hardship, about sacrifice, about putting your body on the line against the dirty tactics of the English bowlers who were bowling body line and not playing the sport properly. And the colonial was showing them how to do it. So this, this is really important, but the, the thing is that, that you know, making light of it, but, but these are really important parts of, of our nation, national story, our national psyche, if you like. The problem, of course, with it is that it, it doesn't tend to include everyone. That is, when we tell the history of, 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 of what it means to be Australian, we're really not telling very many stories still about immigration. We're not telling stories about multiculturalism, we're not telling stories about other things. And the final thing, of course, is symbols. So what does it mean to be Australian? And one of the most common symbols that, that we have as a nation and that, that is shared by them is actually the tomb of the unknown soldier. What it means to be Australian and what it means to be British, what it means to be American, what it means to be New Zealand, what it means to be many other parts of the world is buried in the tomb. And the interesting thing about these tombs is actually that they may be empty. That sometimes that there is nothing in there except imaginings of who we are. But more often, it is, it is just the bones of an unknown soldier. And so there have been moves occasionally to identify who these people are, and there's been massive upcry. That, that no, we don't actually want to know who they are. That, that actually, they are us. They are everything about us. They are who we are. Um, so if you put all of these sorts of things together, what you end up with is a sense of, of national identity, which is very much tied to war and conflict. Um, it may not be 
armed conflict, but it's certainly very much about overcoming hardship against adversary, which is what sport does. Um, and so the stories that we tend to tell ourselves tend to be about us as a nation overcoming this as a group. We, um, we, we didn't beat the Turks, but we hung on for a very long time against the Turks. Um, we stuck together. We stuck together against our country, against physical hardship. We stuck together against uh, cheating um, sporting rivals. Um, we've stuck together, you know, through thick and thin. And if you think about, you know, all of the coverage, for example, of the fires that we had two or three years ago now that, that swept through in, in Victoria, the discourse and the narratives that we told ourselves are the same. Communities come together, Australians come together, we help each other out in times of need. We hold out our hands to each other because that's my issue. Um, and I think that the, 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 the way we keep this going, because it's easy to do in times of crisis, but it's very difficult to develop at the drop of a hat. Right, you can't simply tell people that we've all got to get together if you don't feel that you have anything in common with everyone else and you don't speak the same language. And the way this tends to be done in Australia and other nations is actually through sport. So um, I'm not suggesting that the, the, the symbolism that is used is subtle. I would suggest it's not. But um, this is, these are photos which were actually taken um, both, which were taken last year. Um, it, that's Corporal Ben Robert Smith, most recent BC winner, SAS soldier. Um, and he is at the, uh, the Anzac Day test, uh, Anzac Day game between the Dragons and, I want to say the Rabbits. Um, it occurs every year. Um, the ball and the trophy end up being delivered by a, by a Blackhawk helicopter. Um, one year they actually rappelled down into it. Um, but this time they landed and sort of presented it. And then um, our most recent sporting, uh, our military hero, then kind of made a very quick and rather bashful speech um, and gave the, the spoils of war over to Dave Gallup, who has since been deposed. Um, photos taken, sport, military, not subtle at all. But the really interesting thing is when I get, I get my students to have a look at this game every year and they're always a bit surprised, they've never really thought through, I'm not really sure why. But that whole game is very much about explicitly linking sport and war. The commentary is explicitly about heroism, self-sacrifice, teamwork, mateship. Um, it's all about you know, the battle, going into battle for the diggers. And of course, you know, usually they kind of have been in dwindling numbers, they put all of the World War II vets now into the golf carts, they kind of do the lap of the thing. The AFL does a very similar thing. Um, crowd applauds them. <coughs> the players talk about how they think of the, 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 these heroes as inspiration before they go and play 90 minutes of rugby. Um, and, you know, it, it is a very, very explicit linking. Um, I think the interesting thing about Ben Robert Smith is the fact he looks a little bit like Action Man. <laughs> um, so the, the VC winner before him was also another SAS guy, but he was apparently much shorter. So this guy is um, well over sort of six foot, he is a, a giant. Um, but the other guy was probably about my height, so probably about five foot nine, and he had red hair, and just didn't look like a hero. I think he's actually had a, um, a retirement home named after about near where we live. Um, but that's kind of the, the extent of his kind of memorial. Whereas, whereas this guy, because he looks like a hero, you know, this is what all Australian men, you know, should look like. This is what an Australian <laughs> hero looks like. Um, and so you sort of look at him and, and you think, okay, well, you know, this is what's going on. The interesting thing, though, is that people accept that kind of discourse because if you listen to the commentary at any other time, we're using the same words. Listen to any football commentary. It's about heroism, it's about sacrifice, it's about teamwork. You're going to hear the same thing at the Olympics. Anything you hear about teamwork, they're doing it for their mates. They're working together as a team. It's the, I don't know if they're ever going to use words as that spirit. <laughs> I'm waiting for it. You can play buzzword bingo, and if you write down a list of all the sort of words, Anzac spirit has got to be one of them. You know, it'll be used at some point, I'm sure. The spirit of the Anzacs live on, the diggers. Um, there's bound to be at some point this sort of switch to the soldiers in Afghanistan watching you know, a particularly important Olympic moment. And the reason I had a problem with this is, is basically because 
once people are used to hearing that kind of discourse, it's extremely easy to make the switch from you've got to go along and support your local team to you've really got to go along and, and sign up boys. And in fact, that's something that, that historically has happened. We know. The example of America, the most recent example of America is Patrick Tillman. I don't know if any of you have heard of him. He was a pro um, footballer. Um, his brother joined the Marines when they went into Iraq the second time. He kind of had a bit of a think about it. multi squillion dollars versus a desert and people <coughs> trying to kill me. Um, and went to join his brother. He actually joined up. This was a huge coup for the Marines. Yes, this is what's happening. This is how important it is. He's given up his pro you know, pro career for this and he's gone over. And unfortunately he was killed. Oh. Now, I say unfortunately, obviously it was a tragedy for football fans, it's tragedy for his family, it's tragedy for him. Really good recruiting now again. Because of course, what can you say? He gave everything up and you're still sitting on your asses at home. So sport is used in a very, very <coughs> horrible way, really. And it's particularly aimed towards men because women simply don't get the same coverage. Women aren't expected to self-sacrifice because we're supposed to stay at home and keep the pies burning. And so it's very easy for men to get extremely popular. up. Women may so. And so I have a problem with that. Now, I wouldn't suggest, however, that, that, that this is entirely a one-way street. That is, I think we do have some say in this, and this is the thing I want to talk about. So how do we as citizens actually feel about sport? Now, I suggested that the link between sport and war is often very explicit. Um, it's not a subtle sort of thing, but it works only if we already believe ourselves to be members of the community. That is, if you don't believe yourself to be Australian, who cares what he's done? Really. He's just a bloke in the uniform. Um, you know, it, it's similar uh, studies around uh, national prestige. There's an assumption that sporting success increases national pride in citizens. And the interesting thing is that it does. National pride kind of goes along at this level and does this. And that bit, that's when we're successful in sport. It's not a long-term thing. We all get really passionate about cycling and we get passionate about Tour de France because Cadell won it last year. He didn't do so well this year. And I'm hoping this means that the number of lycra clad people wandering around and very serious about cycling begins to decline. And it'd be interesting to see if in fact that happens. Because sporting success doesn't equate to long-term improvement in national pride. The second thing is, as I said, you need to believe yourself to be a member of the national group in order for it to have any relevance. So, for example, I don't really care very much what happens to New Zealand. If I lived in New Zealand, I still wouldn't care very much what happened to New Zealand because I don't believe or understand myself to believe from New Zealand. And it's the same for people living in Australia or anywhere else that they are not of the main national community. It's irrelevant. So that's the first thing. If you're going to actually use sport for blue blends, you need to actually be prepared to, you know, make sure everyone's kind of included. And of course in Australia, an increasingly diverse population, we're not doing a particularly good job of it, I would suggest. The second thing is that people actually reject the overt politicisation of sport. It really annoys us. It's a bit like the Channel 9 advertising um, for their spring program, right? If, if we have political messages thrust down our throat while we're trying to watch sport, it annoys us and turns us off. And what they've shown, they examined what happened in the GDR. So the GDR, um, under the doping policy, massively successful athletes. These people were kicking ass left, right and centre. Sport tends to make me speak like this. It tends to turn me the bocker. I'm sorry. Um, you know, it, 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 they were incredibly successful. But people in the GDR, citizens in the GDR, recognised what was actually going on. And they actually turned, first of all, against well, the government in general, I suspect they weren't happy with the government to start with. They turned against sport and the use of sport, and specifically elite sport, in this way. Because, of course, what happened was all the available funding kind of got sucked up into the people right at the top, and it kind of left everyone else with not very much. Um, so they were left with nothing. So sport became a massive turn off. And they actually turned against the athletes as well. So athletes did come back, and they were, in fact, rejected by a large number of their fellow citizens. So we tend to actually reject overt politicisation of sport. The athletes tend to reject the politicisation of sport. They've tended to go down the route of, it is just sport. There's nothing political about it. 
Um, international football is the best example of this, actually. Um, in the 1930s, there's, there's apparently, and I wanted to find it, because the internet was now, I couldn't. There's apparently a photo in existence of the English national team giving the Nazis salute in 1938 um, as part of the spoilers of diplomacy. And the English Football Federation sort of said, oh, we were just being polite, really. Um, nothing to do with politics. And of course, sort of, they've, they've maintained that kind of sense of, well, what we do is play sport, that's our job. You deal with politics elsewhere. Because all we really want to do is, is just, just play sport, play games. Um, the the Iran USA game that I mentioned before, also they also rejected that this was a sport a game about the relationship between the two countries. Basically they also said, um, really we just want to play the game, we're really gonna get on with it, um, carry on elsewhere. Um, there is an explicit aversion to politics. And the spectators themselves actually also really rejected the whole notion of what it was about, which was really about Iran and the USA, and turned it into a bit of a discourse among the spectators about Iranians who supported the revolution and Iranians who had left Iran as a result of the revolution. Um, and so there was sort of some, some, some things going on in the crowd, which were more about that, and the USA was really left both on the middle of the pitch running around and kind of left on the sidelines wondering what was going on. Um, but also then about making political statements. Um, so obviously the most um, well known about this which involved an Australian at Olympics was actually the, um, our involvement in like, Power Salute in Mexico, um, which was a, a critical moment for what we call it. It's apparently um, our idea. Um, Kathy Freeman was another example of this, carrying both the Indigenous and the Australian flag um, at, at the 2000 Olympics, but also before the Commonwealth Games in 1998. Um, when she made an explicit statement about both her indigeneity and her Australianness, and made a statement about what it meant to be Australian, and um, because the internet was down, this is the best example I had, and of course, um, within sport. So this is Nicky Winmar um, making the point to Collingwood supporters that he was in fact indigenous and that racist taunts really didn't come around too much. Well, thank you, Fiona. I'm a bit upset about that reference to Lycra. I when I go out cycling, I think I look better in my Lycra than in this. Yeah. But nevertheless, the point is taken. And, uh, uh, I really thank you, uh, Fiona. But um, for the moment, let's, uh, let's uh, hear what others have got to say. I think the way that they're going to, to, to leap up and down in their very genteel way about it is to claim that what he was wearing wasn't part of their official official uniform. So it, it's going to come down to Randy, effectively. Um, yeah, it's, it's a tricky one, isn't it? Because you give people a uniform because you want them to all look alike. And yet he was obviously making a statement about, well, this is who I am. And I think it does show. I think that the interesting thing is that it was, I think we have come a lot, a long way from when Kathy Freeman carried the flag. In that, that was, I mean, I was in Scotland at the time. I just remember seeing it. Um, it was made front page news in Edinburgh, which says something about how big it must have been here. Um, so I think that the, the relative lack of interest in it probably indicates that for most people it isn't as big a deal as it was. But I, and I think. But for me, the bigger issue is the fact that we do only have two or three Indigenous people actually in town. And so if we're going to talk about, you know, the fact we still have a very long way to go, you know, let's talk about the fact that, that you know, we don't have a representative Australian team at all. That, that we don't have, we're not encouraging indigenous, young Indigenous people to do anything other than play AFL and um, league. Um, which are not sports which were one Olympic, but two, they don't, they don't tend to, they tend to be quite brutal on the body. They push into boxing, which again tends to be brutal on the body. We're not, we're not doing enough. Um, and I think that's one of the, one of the, the biggest issues that we have. I think that the other challenge that we have as a nation in terms of Indigenous participation in sport is that it's class-based. And in this we share our problem with places like America, which has an, another, another, another problem around it. That, that if you're going to, if you're poor and you're going to go into professional sports where hopefully you're going to make money, 
Um, we know, no studies have been done in Australia about this, but we know that in America, uh, black athletes, black male athletes are overrepresented in terms of sports scholarships. We know that something like 70% of people on sports scholarships fail to graduate. And we know that um, only, I think it's about 30% of people on sports scholarships end up having a professional career. So what you then have is a large number of people who either don't go to college, which is one issue, but those who are going to college aren't making it through. So I think we all have to have a little look at that. If we're going to use sport as a means of social inclusion, let's make sure it works. But I think there are other means of mechanisms of doing it. I know that probably doesn't answer your question, but I just think it's one of those really complicated issues around well, how do we actually, how do we attack it? Because I, I don't think that it's a fabulous idea, for example, to suggest to Indigenous children the way out of poverty is through sport. Because you look at people like Michael Long is one example, AFL footballer, brilliant footballer. He's ended his career and actually is basically crippled with arthritis and he's only in his 40s. Um, you know, it, it, it's not a long term solution. Uh, you know, the only way we can do it is through education. So we're looking at education and sport. That's another issue. That's cool. Um, one of the big issues around the Olympics is frequently the fact that most of the funding goes to elite sports. So, and they tend to come from people who can either a state sponsor to start with. So, if you look at um, China, and one of the reasons China is doing so well is because they grab kids at an extremely young age, do some testing on them, and then train them. And you know that's the way to win because you actually support them through everything. Of course, if you injure yourself at the age of about 15, that's, that's pretty much curtains and you've got no other skills. But if your sole aim is to win, then, you know, again, necessary attrition. But I think that the debate comes in, most of the problems within countries comes if you put all the money into elite sports and not enough into grassroots sports. So that is, you're not supporting you know, children going out and playing. You know, you're actually encouraging just you know, the district representatives, the state representatives, national representatives. Um, the thing I think internationally that matters is, and this is where things are quite quite interesting as well, is that the people that it seems, the nations it seems to matter to in terms of how much you can afford to spend tend to be the rich countries anyway. And so the poorer countries who don't put as much money in are either extremely good at what they do, so I'm thinking here about long farm, say Kenya for instance, who, you know, produces extremely good long distance runners, but probably doesn't have, I would suggest, the same infrastructure around athletics as Britain or America or Australia does. So either they're extremely good, or they're kind of patted on the head in a rather patronising way. So think about, um, I want to say Eric the Eel, um, in the 2000 Olympics. You know, obviously not much money for him swimming in that country, um, but we kind of all cheered for him because he wasn't a threat. That country wasn't a threat. So there you have this sort of sense of what you're participating and that's enough. It's a bit like giving everyone a trophy for participation. So, but I don't actually think that people measure GDP against investment in sport unless they don't do well. If you do well, then it's money considered well spent. If you don't do well, either it's money wasted, so you've got to use it better, or, you, you know, you've got to spend more. Um, but it depends what your relationship is to how much money you've actually got and also what, what you're actually, you know, how good you are to start with and how much your nation's identity actually rides on investment in that particular sport, whether you have new problems. And the German swimmers were really, really interesting. The Chinese swimmers, I think, were also very interested in that way. Um, in terms of, of the way that the German swimmers were, were portrayed, um, out on the German athletes generally, female athletes generally were portrayed. Um, it's when sex testing was actually brought in, was, was specifically about that, to make sure that these were, in fact, women and not men pretending to be women. Um, so that's, that's, that, that was when that was first brought in. Um, the really interesting thing, if you look at the coverage about that, was if you have a look at people like Dawn Fraser, 
and, and these sorts of things. The, 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 the way that we in Australia dealt with it, the coverage there was really very much around the Golden Girls and these, these are examples of you know, Australian femininity against these not quite women. <laughs> and, you know, not quite women is in one word, obviously. Um, the, the thing that about so both the German swimmers, female swimmers, and the, the Chinese swimmers is actually it, it, using them as examples of nationhood is entirely in keeping with the political ideology of those places. That is, men and women need to contribute equally. Um, it's kind of very much around that sort of socialist sort of ideal. The, interest, the other interesting thing about that particular period of time is around women's gymnastics. Because that was the period, and particularly the 80s, was when you saw the existence, the, the sudden appearance of, you know, um, is it called Nadia? Yeah. Exactly. Right. Um, you know, these little elfin, prepubescent waifs who just flew. Um, and, and at that point, that was the first time when, you know, it, it's the, the point where, you know, the equation between sport and war is problematic. Gymnastics is one of those areas. Figure skating is another one, but gymnastics is one of those areas. Because the notion of you know someone who weighs you know five kilos soaking wet, being a soldier for the nation, is a little bit ridiculous, and yet gymnastics is entirely militarized. You look at the the marching, you look at the the, the strength work, you look at all that sort of stuff. It has very very well military um, basis, um, and so it, it's very interesting. There's a, there's a great article written by Anne Chisholm about um, the nineteen. 1998, 1996, I think, um, Olympics, which is the first time that, that American gymnasts beat the Russians. And it's all about that kind of sense of what does it mean to be American, and, and these, these little girls um, were carrying the weight of the, the nation on their shoulders, and what did it mean to be American. Um, so gymnastics is the other area, but again, they're not, they weren't, um, they were androgynous at that period as well. Swimmers were also androgynous. They didn't have obvious feminine characteristics. They had broad shoulders, slim hips, no breasts, muscular. You know, if you look at the gymnasts now, because they've obviously raised the age at which point they can actually participate, we don't have the 12-year-olds doing ridiculous things. We don't have you know, 17-year-olds doing ridiculous things. Um, it's fairly obvious that they're women, they're female. Um, and I wonder what you know, I think people still watch gymnastics, but I don't know how we're going to talk about it or whether it will be used in the same way. I think it's going to be quite interesting to see. It's interesting because if you look at the studies that have been done of women's CEOs, you'll find that women are as competitive as men and are less likely to help women, fellow women. Well, they may have taken on those sort of androgynous well, possibly. That you've I, I think that it's very, I, I'm very cautious about suggesting that, that women are less competitive than men because I think it's, it comes down very much to how you're brought up. And I, my experience of women it tends to be that we're as competitive as men, but we're sneakier about it. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe we should be playing chess instead. I, 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 <laughs> I think that one of the things, one of the interesting things about athletes of all ilks is, first of all, they are hugely competitive, which is why they get to the top. Because if you're not going to try to win, you're not going to do very well. You know, I don't know two great arms, and one of them had no will to win at all, which is why she got <laughs> prepared. Because you know, she would sort of run along, and other dogs would begin competing, so she would drop back and kind of run in circles behind everyone. <laughs> um, no will to win, not going to win races. Um, Top athletes obviously don't have that. They have that striving to go. It means they're not very nice people. They're very selfish, they're very driven, they're very focused. That's what makes them win. But I, I don't think that I, I would be really, really cautious about suggesting that the reason women are not, I, I don't think women are less competitive than men. As I said, I think that we're taught to be quieter and we're taught that it's not very nice to be openly competitive. And um, that actually women who are openly competitive tend to be derided as being masculine, as being called lesbians. You know, there's a, way, a whole series of ways of, of, of making sure that women stay in their boxes. But I don't think that means that they're less competitive. I think it just means a bit quieter about it as a general rule.
The stuff about um, football as being a pathway is really based on what I've seen in America and what I've seen in American sport. That is, sport is presented to um, young black men as a means out of the ghetto. Now, three quarters of young black American men believe that they are going to get a professional football or basketball career. Three quarters. Um, not very many of them get that far. But the problem with using sports as a mechanism for pulling people up is the fact that if they focus purely on sport, they neglect schooling. Because schooling is not important because, of course, you're going to be the next year. And so it's very, very problematic to use sport as a mechanism or rely on sport as a mechanism for actually getting people out of poverty. And it's very, very easy to describe it because, of course, when people start playing sport and playing sport professionally or at a high level, what you actually end up doing is pushing them in that direction. They blow out a knee and then they're 20 years old with no skills and no education. So it's problematic. You can use sport in conjunction with education, but it has to be done very, very carefully. And so far in America, they've been trying for a very long time they haven't managed it. So my view is you have to be careful and we're going to be better off placed. If you can get people playing Aussie rules, but one of the conditions of playing Aussie rules in a know, attending coaching clinics or getting this sort of scholarship is that you maintain, you know, the, an a, a B or C average, for example, or you pass this many grades or you get to this reading level. Great. You know, that's fine. But if you just sort of say sport is going to be the way forward, that's extremely problematic and if it's from America since it doesn't work. In terms of representing Australia, my problem with you know, say, you, suggesting that what happens is the best and brightest get in is actually the best and brightest get in because they're the ones who, who are able to play that sport and are encouraged to do so both by our family but also by the clubs. So, you know, part of it's about physical aptitude, yes, but part of it's also about encouraging, you know, other people to actually participate in the sport. So, for example, in netball, some the netball um, federation I used to play in um, had rules about what you have to, what uniform you have to wear, down to what sort of underwear you have to wear under your skirt. You have to wear the vest of a particular colour. You can't wear white pants, and you have to, you know, some clubs have actually gone to skin tight body suits. And we had the example of um, a, an Islamic girl who came up who wanted to play netball. And of course, we then had to go to our federation and point out that what we needed to do was get this girl in, but she needed to play in tracksuit pants with the skirt over the top and a t-shirt over the top, and she needed to wear a head, her headdress. And so we needed to actually negotiate a completely different uniform in order to do that. Most places aren't prepared to do that. So I don't think it is just about physical attitude.